quantum computing. This week, we've had a lot of media interest on the whole subject of quantum computing, and I must say, it's not the easiest subject to tackle. A couple of episodes last time, we on Razor covered quantum computing as a subject. And because of all this media interest, I thought it would be great to do a Facebook Live to really try and debunk all the myths and complexities around the subject. I'm Shanice Omara, and I'm joined by Professor Hensinger, who is head of the ION quantum computing department at the University of Sussex. And we're going to just talk about what quantum computing is. So can you help me with this subject? Because it's not the easiest, is it? Yeah, it's, it's very counterintuitive. It's nothing like conventional computing. It all relies on a very, very strange physics theory called quantum physics. And that's a very strange theory. Einstein called it spooky. He called it spooky because they're very strange phenomena such as that you could be sitting here in the studio and being at home both at the same time. So an object can be at two places at the same time. That's how strange this theory is. In the lab, we can actually make that happen, not with people, but with, it, with individual atoms. And we can have them in two different places at the same time. So are you saying that um, this idea that with with conventional computers, let's go right back to basics. With conventional computers, it works on this principle of ones and zeros. And so you're saying that quantum computers can actually be one and zero at the same time? That's right. So in, in conventional computers, information like numbers, or words, is encoded as a string of zeros and ones, and we call them bits. Mm. And so your name or number, they're all strings of zeros and ones. That's like how a we. Like barcode. Exactly, exactly. Right. Now, in a quantum computer, we also encode information, but we use quantum bits. And now, just in an analogy, as I, as I mentioned before, that an object can be at two different places at the same time. In quantum computing, a bit can be both zero and one at the same time. But what does that actually mean for answering questions? Because this week, Google claimed that they have the supremacy over quantum computing and that they, the computers they've built um, can solve problems within seconds that would take supercomputers 10,000 years to solve. So the bigger picture of quantum computers or why people consider them the holy grail of, of computing, of science, is that quantum computers are capable of solving certain problems where even the fastest supercomputer would take billions of years to calculate. And that includes numerous sectors, from drug discovery, creating better drugs, from optimizations, revolutionizing the financial sector, by understanding chemical reactions. Applications are nearly everywhere. But now we need to look closely at where we are right now with this field. So what Google has realized is what we term, it's an academic term, it's called quantum supremacy. What that means is that Google has picked one particular problem, and that is unfortunately only a very academic problem. So it's not a useful application, a useful problem. It's a purely academic problem. But with this particular problem, they managed for their quantum computer to solve that problem. And they say that no conventional computer can actually solve that problem. Now, this has been disputed by IBM. So IBM says they are now found a way how a conventional computer may take that problem. There's a bit of a battle going on between Google That's and right. IBM at the moment on this subject, isn't there? That's right. So both Google and IBM use a technology called superconducting qubits. And the challenge with this technology is to scale this up to very large number of qubits. So to give you a feeling, so some of the really interesting problems in quantum computer computers will require millions or billions of qubits to, for, for a quantum computer to solve that problem. Google and IBM are only right now at 50 qubits. And so they're really focusing on this one problem being quantum supremacy, because that's obviously ver a very important milestone for their technology. Mm, here, yeah. here in the UK, we work on an alternative technology made of trapped, charged atoms or ions. And the nice thing about this technology is that we are able to go to much larger qubit numbers much faster. And this is why here in the UK we are not so excited about this uh, quantum supremacy. OK, so we'll get back to that point, because that's such a crucial point later on. But going right back to the foundations of quantum computing, 
Um, when you read up about it, you hear about entanglement and superposition. What do these things mean? What's superposition? Yeah, so superposition is this very strange quantum phenomenon, uh, meaning that an object can be generally at two places at the same time. You may have heard of, of a famous example called the Schrodinger cat, uh, Schrodinger's cat, where within a thought experiment, a cat can be both dead and alive at the same time. So that's something we've all heard of, and it really this freaked out scientists mm -hmm. for the last 50 years, and they tried over and over and over to do the experiment, to do experiments somewhat trying to understand, or in fact discredit that theory. Right. It really bugged Einstein, didn't it? He wasn't happy with this concept of quantum physics. He, he didn't like it. He said, God doesn't throw dice. So he really disliked it and tried to come up with ways how to disprove this. And, and over the 50 years, people came up with all sorts of experiments trying to drill a hole into that theory. Right. But over and over, each experiment actually came out with one result only, and that is quantum physics is the correct theory. It exists. It exists. So how come that quantum physics has been around for so long, yet, it's a hundred years or something, yeah. isn't it? Mm. But yet, we, ha we are not able to prove that it exists. We just know that it does. We have to just trust that we know. So in physics, um, it's actually impossible to ever prove a theory. It's very easy to disprove a theory. Right. And so, so we can never prove that a theory is correct, but we can, we can show, is there any hole? Is there anything wrong with that theory? And people really tried very hard to try these holes and came up with experiments to show that. And that's what I was saying, that all of these experiments only ever um, provided more support for this theory. And now I think worldwide scientists have accepted that this theory holds. But they have taken this now one step further and they ask now the question, can we actually tame these very strange quantum effects to build machines that are capable of achieving something no other conventional technology could ever achieve? And that's what I loved about the film that we made with you, is that quantum physics is so strange, mm -hmm. so complex. Mm -hmm. And you have come along and you said, yes, it is very complex, but now let's do something with the complexity and turn it into something that we can work with, let's build a computer. Yeah. So this is the really cool thing I, I can actually do now. So I've started, did my PhD working on trying to debark and understand, understand this very strange theory. But now for the last maybe 20 years uh, in my group at the University of Sussex, we've been really set out to actually build a practical machine. So not just to do scientific experiment, but to take this one step further, to tame these very effects and to build practical technology. Technology which would enable us to bring on all these fantastic applications such as drug discovery, um, understanding protein folding, and with that maybe we'll be able to find a cure for dementia, understanding chemical reactions. Mm. And there's, there's such a broad width of applications. But to be honest, it's very unlikely that we've even discovered the most important applications yet. We are literally just right now at the start of developing this, this new technology. It seems like we're only at the beginning of understanding where quantum computers can take us because we're so consumed with figuring out how to make quantum computers work, let alone the questions we could ask the computers. Yeah. Is that right? That's exactly right. So, so one of the f important things to know is that literally everything around us is governed by quantum physics. So, so your pen, the, the material of this table, the color of, of, of my shirt, all of these are governed by quantum physics. So quantum physics is an extremely important theory. Now, if we have a tool that enables us to solve quantum physical problems, that means we can come to an entirely new understanding and develop entirely new means, which would have been completely impossible to do with, with conventional computers, because most problems are simply intractable on a conventional computers if you want to simulate or understand the exact quantum equations of that particular problem. Right, so superposition, I kind of get it, it's very strange, but you can be in two places at the same time and you're doing that on a subatomic level. So you're trying to make charged atoms mm. be at two places at the same time mm. and that's how your computers are working. But what's entanglement? 
Okay, so entanglement is even more counterintuitive than superposition. So entanglement is some kind of correlation. So let, let me let me let me start very simple. So if I have a coin, if I would have a coin right now in 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 my hand, so imagine like I put that into one hand, right, and I put it behind my back, and I'm going to ask you in which of my two hands is this coin, right? So, so that is what we call a classical correlation. You don't know in which hand it is, but if you know it is in this hand, you also know it's not going to be in this hand, right? So that's what we call this a classical correlation. And, and so entanglement, however, however, is an even more complicated correlation because what it means is that we have two particles and they can be far distant. They can be at two different ends of the universe. Yet, it, an action on one of these objects will do something to the object on the other end of the universe, but without these objects communicating. How do we know that's happening? Yeah, so this is where, where these extremely compli complicated experiments come in. So for the last 100 years, physicists have come up with more and more complicated experiments, trying to, first of all, prove that entanglement exists, but also trying to find some kind of loophole how can this even be? How can, uh, where, where is this link coming from? And so they have become extremely sophisticated using atoms, using photons. People sent them even to satellites and back and, and all sorts of things trying to figure out where is the hole or does this, really, does this really work? And all these experiments, again, confirmed uh, what we call is a spooky action at a distance. That's uh, actually a, a term coined by Einstein. And it is really exactly that spooky because these things um, have an effect on top of on, on each other without being able to communicate and without having an inherent property in each of these two particles. It is really spooky. And on that note of spookiness, as we head towards Halloween this week, um, please do keep your questions coming in. This is Facebook Live. Let's take the opportunity to really ask Professor Hensinger as many questions as you want about quantum computing. You know, it's not the easiest of subjects. It's taken me a while to wrap my head around it, and I'm not even sure I'm there yet. Um, but ask whatever you want about these very strange concepts of entanglement and superposition. So you've explained what those things are. I think I understand it. But how are you actually applying those concepts to a computer? Um. So what we do is we, we now need a quantum system that is capable of being fully controlled because we need to really have some kind of control onto superpositions. We need to be able to create superposition on demand and we need to be able to then allow this to, to evolve as such. So we need to have full control. And it's actually very, very hard to build anything where we can control quantum effects to the degree, to degree, degree required to build a quantum computer. And so if you like, I can tell you a little bit about how we actually physically do this right now in our labs. Yeah, because my basic understanding, especially after making the mm. film about your work, mm. is that computers operate in a very basic way. It's either one, zero, mm. off or on. It's like a logic gate can be one state or another. That's right. That's exactly not what you do with quantum computers, isn't it? That's right. That's right. So, so there's this um, nice way to think about this. If you think of a very, very simple memory stick, so imagine a memory stick which is only where you can only store two bits. So two, two bits. And imagine, for example, that we're going to write now one particular word or combination of zeros and one into this memory stick. So, for example, zero one, right? So if I have two quantum bits, however. Instead of just writing, for example, 0, 1 into this quantum memory stick, I can write simultaneously 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 all at the same time. So you can see a quantum memory stick, I can say four numbers with, if there's two quantum bits in a, in a, in a classical two-bit memory, I can only write in one number. Now, if you take this much further, then this becomes much more impressive. So if you have 100 bits, you get a huge number of different combinations I can encode into 100 quantum bits. And so suddenly the power of a quantum computer really becomes apparent because now we can encode all the numbers simultaneously into these, into these quantum bits. 
why did we need to build these computers? Because computers, as we know them, were getting really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And we have these things called supercomputers that are handling huge uh, questions and crunching through lots of data. Why did we need, why do we need to make this leap into the quantum world? So you'd think that supercomputers and computers nowadays are very powerful, and they absolutely are for us at home. If we want to do word processing, some computer games, they're very, very impressive. But for some of the really most important scientific problems, supercomputers are usually not powerful enough. So to give you an example, it costs around 2.5 billion pounds to develop one new drug. 2.5 billion pounds, it probably takes around 10 years. And the reason why it's so expensive and it takes so long is because simply conventional computers are not powerful enough and you have to do experiment after experiment after experiment trying to somewhat make it there. Now quantum computers would have the capability to simulate the quantum dynamics within the molecules, with, within uh, the whole process of drug discovery. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that we suddenly have an extremely powerful tool in our hand to solve problems that we could not solve any other way. So it's a very disruptive technology, a, a completely step change in the way we can tackle and solve problems. Yeah, the way I see it is that um, with conventional computers, you're usually answering a very discrete question. It has a very, not simple answer, mm -hmm. but it has an answer. Whereas with quantum computing, you don't know if an answer exists and there are many unknowns and a quantum computer can handle all of those unknowns. So, so in, in, in a way, because the problems, when you want to really solve them based on, on the theory you need to apply, which is quantum physics, the computational space and the computational resources you require to solve them exactly so quickly become so huge that even the biggest supercomputer, and these supercomputers f can fill a full warehouse, so they, they can be bigger than a football field, just mm -hmm. one supercomputer. Now, even these machines struggle to solve some of these problems. What we do nowadays is we try to simplify problems in such a way that a conventional computer can solve them. But that also means that maybe the answer we now get out of the conventional computer is not the right answer anymore because we simplified the problem so much. Yeah. The nice thing about a quantum computer is that it allows us to actually solve the quantum physics problems. And that give us, gives us then the opportunity to create outcomes which we could never even dream about uh, creating before. And that means we could create new materials, maybe very strong materials, but, but also very light. We could, we could model the flow and of, of in aircraft engines, make much better aircraft engines, mm. make better wings. Uh, we can optimize um, problems in, across financial sector, portfolio optimization. So, so really, this is, this is something where we have these ex extremely wide range of possibilities. And we don't have to hold back on our curiosity. I think that's ex what you say is actually the most important thing. And that is, we have now suddenly a tool in our hand where we have an entirely new way to understand nature. Because we have a tool in our hand that actually makes use of the very mechanics of how nature works at the most smallest scale. And now that allows us again to now simulate nature with a precision never done before. All of that by just being able to control a charged atom. That's right. Pretty impressive. That's right, but it's not just one charged atom. Now we get to the technology. So at the University of Sussex, we have created a new uh, hardware platform, a new technique uh, to control individual charged atoms or ions, such as that we'll be able to work with eventually millions or billions of qubits. And just to put this in the context, so the, the world record by Google and IBM lies at 53. But you need a billion qubits in order to solve some of these really interesting problems. And so this is why... We're getting there, slowly. <laughs> Absolutely. 50 to a billion. Um, <laughs> well, so Absolutely. we have a question from the audience. Uh, oh gosh, many questions. So, is India involved in quantum computing? Um, so, so there are groups in India who have started engaging in this field. Um, India has not yet reached the same, the same um, maybe progress as other countries. So the United States uh, uh, is very good. 
actually the United Kingdom is one of the world leaders and that is partially due to, to a very early government invest, investment in UK's national quantum technology program and that has really accelerated UK as, as one of the leaders worldwide in that. Recently, China has made a very large investment into quantum computing, and, and so China is now really pushing to, to realize this technology as well. And then within Europe, there is the European uh, flagship. So this is a new flagship program which tries to also um, capitalize on some of the academic progress in Europe in quantum computing. So there's a lot of interest in developing quantum computers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think it's mainly just getting your head around it because it's, it's really not easy to to kind of understand because this this is not a conventional way of thinking. It requires us to drop what we've ever understood and known in the way questions are answers and answers uh, and take on a whole new approach. That's right. Uh, that's right. But even more so than that, it is the ability to control a quantum system to that kind of degree. Mm. This is where we here in the UK have have really, really made tremendous progress, but now not just academically, but now we're really in the process of building practical machines. It's becoming a reality. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so a question from the audience. How much does a quantum computer cost? <laughs> uh, very, very expensive. So first, quantum computers, actually just like conventional computers, are gonna be extremely expensive. The way you're gonna interact with a quantum computer is not that you're gonna buy yourself a machine and put yourself in the office, unless your office is very, very large and you have a lot of money. Uh, what you, how you interact with them is you log via the cloud into a quantum computer and you can solve problems from your computer at home via the cloud on a quantum computer. Now, at the beginning, quantum computers are gonna be very expensive and gonna be used only for problems which are hard enough so it's even worthwhile mm. to use a quantum computer. But with time, the price of quantum computers is going to come down, and so more people will be able to access quantum computers. Actually, leading on t from that is a great question. How do you know that the answer is right? First of all, it would have taken a conventional computer, say, 10,000 years to come mm. up with an answer. Yeah. How do you know in a few seconds that a quantum computer solution mm. is the right one? OK, so I'll give you an example. Um, so. That's actually a very, very uh, hard technical problem in terms of developing the hardware. But to give you a feeling, I'll give you like a, a maybe the more overarching answer to that. So one of the problems a quantum computer is now on, uh, to be able to solve is to break encryption based on an on a encryption scheme called RSA encryption. So if you put your credit card details on the internet right now, if you send an encode, encrypted message, it is encrypted by RSA encryption. And RSA encryption relies on the difficulty of factorizing a large number. So what means factorizing, if I give you nine, it's three times three, right? So I factorize nine in my head. Mm -hmm. It turns out it's a really hard mathematical problem when you go to really large numbers. Mm -hmm. And it turns out even conventional computers ca are not capable enough once this number becomes large enough. So the factorization problem is hard, but then to try to see whether your answer of factorizing is correct is actually a simple problem. So, so let's take the example of nine. So in my factorized is three times three, right? So to work that out, that the factors of nine are three is actually a mathematically hard problem. Mm. But to then verify that that is the correct answer, I simply just have to multiply three times three. Yeah. That's actually a mathematical simple problem. Yeah. And so th th just to give you a taste, of how quantum compute, how, how we can verify the quantum computers give the right results simply by seeing whether that mathematical problem is solved correctly. And there's other examples where, where you, you can apply similar tricks. On the other hand, um, fundamentally, in order to make sure that the machine really works correctly, we can build in lots of little testing mechanisms into the actual hardware, uh, and we call that error correction. And, and using that, we can really verify that the machine works correctly. I guess the beauty of quantum computing is you don't have to wait too long to be able to verify your answer. It's not like you have to wait 10,000 years and then check if it's right. You can just wait 200 seconds, <laughs> apparently, according That's to Google. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so a question. When will this lab have built its first functional computer? So, so in, in, in my group at Sussex, we don't just have one, but we have five functional quantum computers right now. But what means functional? 
these machines are right now proof of principle machines that have the capability to demonstrate that we can do computations on a very small scale. What we're working right now is to build bigger practical machines, as I said before, that now feature a large number of qubits. So we work towards building machines that have millions of billions of qubits. And actually for that purpose, we, we just um, started recently a company which will actually manufacture electronic quantum computing modules based on the academic progress we've done in my group in Sussex. And that's actually a brilliant question because uh, our episode on quantum computing, episode two of Razor, we went on a journey looking at your labs, mm -hmm. looking at how you isolate different parts of the quantum computing system. And then you showed us in lab three mm -hmm. this prototype of the final computer that you're hoping mm -hmm. to build. And then you want to modulate. So you want to almost like Lego blocks, That's fine. stick them together so that you can build more and more powerful um, quantum computers. But what I want to know is, what are you doing at Sussex that is so different from what Google and IBM are doing? So Google and IBM use a technology called superconducting qubits. Now superconducting qubits are electrical circuitry, but in order for that to work, you have to cool that all the way down to minus 273 degrees Celsius. That's absolute zero, isn't that's it? That's right, that's right. It doesn't get colder than that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so in order to achieve that, you have to put the microchip in a huge refrigerator, a refrigerator as big as this studio in, 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 in size. And you can only f f fit a few tens or hundreds of qubits on one of these chips. And then this machine will only just barely uh, make it. So this is really nice to do proof of principle demonstrations, but it's really questionable whether you can build practical quantum computers with millions of billions of qubits with that technology. Mm, very so bulky. Exactly. Would need a lot of space. But more importantly, the cooling power available for these refrigerators is simply not enough to even host as many qubits as you'd need. So right. it's actually technically nearly impossible to achieve that. So at Sussex, we have therefore decided, and in fact, I've decided this 20 years ago, to work with a different technology. These are trapped ions. And the nice thing about this technology, it's a room temperature technology. Now, you'd think, OK, that makes it simple or easy to build a quantum computer. Trapped ions used to have other difficult challenges. One of these challenges was that you trapped individual ions with traps that were made out of metal rods. And so imagine, this is very hard to build a quantum computer made out of metal rods. So around 15 years ago, uh, we built the very first iron microchip, which can now hold these ions levitating above the surface of the microchip. So we got rid of one of the big challenges. The second challenge was the, was the requirement of trapped iron quantum computers that you need pairs of laser beams focused on the position of each ion. So imagine you'd need, if you have a billion qubits, you need a billion of pairs of laser beams focused on the position of each of these ions. That is the engineering that's challenge that would have been lasers. required. And that's, I remember that from our film, is like the amount of lasers that would be required to just uh, yeah. focus yeah. on each yeah. ion. Yeah. It's unrealistic. Exactly. And so at Sussex, we came up with an alternative approach. Instead of using laser beams, we use uh, microwaves, the same microwaves as actually being used in mobile phones currently. And using, using this technology, we, we've been able to make an approach where you can execute quantum gates simply by the application of a voltage to a microchip, actually very similar to the operation of a transistor or a classical microprocessor. So these are the two ingredients we've been able to realize. And that allows us now to really push forward towards building practical machines which will host millions or billions of qubits. In fact, one of the things I, I've, I've forgotten, which is another really key ingredient that we, we've added to the system design, a quantum computer needs to be modular. The reason why a quantum computer needs to be modular because you will only fit so many qubits onto each quantum computing module. And then you've reached the largest size a microchip can ever be because of the, 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 the way these machines work. Mm. So they're always going to be big, aren't they? That's right, that's yeah. right, that's right. They have to be very big, but they have to be modular. And this modularity is really important to achieve. Traditionally, people tried to use photonic interconnects or optical fibers to connect these quantum computing modules together. The problem is that the world record, after trying to develop this for probably 15 years, is only around 20 per second 
connection speed. So that's way too slow. Mm. So it's because like of these fibers. Exactly. It's not the technologically fiber, advanced enough. That's right. But, but people tried really hard. The very best minds try to get speed mm. this up for 10, 15 years. And the world record still sits around at, at, at tens per second. Gosh. So we've developed this alternative approach where we use electric fields to bridge quantum computing models, modules. So we now connect quantum computing modules using electric fields. And with that, we've been able to realize an architecture capable of an increase of connection speed of four orders of magnitude. And to bring all these things together allowed us now to really think about actually building a practical quantum computer. Which is a great segue into a question that we had, which is how long will it be before we get personal computers? And can I just say at this point, thank you so much for your questions. Keep them coming in because they're brilliant. But yeah, how long will it be before we, we all are using quantum computers to do our invoices? So <laughs> I don't think you probably ever use quantum computers to do invoices because for whatever problem you can use a conventional computer, you should always use a conventional computer. They're good computer. enough. The computers good enough. we have do the exactly job. Exactly right. If you have a problem which can be solved by a conventional computer, you should only ever use a conventional computer for that because they're, they're going to be a lot cheaper and easier to operate. So, so, so quantum computers are going to be used for problems which a conventional computer could just never tackle, not even in principle. Like what? What would be a typical question? So if you want to understand the chemical reactions going on that, that make up the process of creating a new drug, like, you know, this means like if you want to create a new pharmaceutical, if you want to create, understand even processes in biology, like protein folding, if you wanted to have a better way to create fertilizer, a better um, way, a more efficient way to create fertilizer, you need to understand something what's called nitrogen fixation. So these are really hard and really difficult problems. And these are the problems we're going to use on, on quantum computers. But as quantum com computers become better developed, uh, they're going to become cheaper. And then we can also use them for problems which may be not quite as, as of important in a way than, 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 and maybe eventually we're going to use them to play computer games, really yeah. fancy computer games. Well, that was one of the applications, wasn't it? Gaming, like people yeah. can start playing games together all across the go globe. So, uh, so quantum computers are, are not really um, tailored for that particular application right now, but equally we don't really know what some of the applications of quantum computers will be. So, so I'd say, so it's hard to, to understand right now how we're going to use them in our personal life because we kind of focus completely right now only on some really hard problems that have a huge impact on the way we live. So this is really to create an ability, a capability, which can deliver things we couldn't even dream about before. Um, and, and I think in a way you're going to use quantum computers at home at the beginning just to train yourself in this new way how to program quantum computers and, and understand the capabilities. So that's going to be the first applications for, for, for people at home. And then you're going to push uh, boundaries of where you couldn't just use a computer any other way. Well, Professor Hensinger, it's been absolutely amazing to have you on this Facebook Live piece. Um, thank you for debunking all the myths and the complexity around quantum computing. I hope, as an audience, you've got your head around it somewhat. It's not easy, I must admit. But please do watch our episode, episode two of Quantum Computing on Razor, CG10 Europe. And thank you for joining us. Join us next time.